Hello and welcome to our second In Union conversation today, inspired by the new film Race to Save the World. Union Chapel is proud to be hosting a special online screening of Race to Save the World, the documentary film bar from Joe Gantz that follows the inspiring stories of everyday people aged 15 to 72 who are devoting their lives to fighting climate change. My name is Michael Chandler. I'm the CEO of Union Chapel Project. For this conversation, I'm very pleased to be joined by Bridget McKenzie. Bridget is a creative curator and researcher, founding director of Flow Associates and Climate Museum UK, as well as co-founder of Culture Declares Emergency. Bridget, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I wish I was out in that lovely sun. It is a glorious day today, isn't it? It's uh, yeah. started to warm up finally. Uh, tell me, uh, Bridget, uh, tell me some more about uh, both uh, Climate Museum UK and Culture Declares uh, Emergency. Well, what have you been doing and what, what are those organisations working on? OK, so Climate Museum UK is an experimental museum or creative organisation. It's an activist museum. Um, we don't have a venue. We're um, mobile, digital and distributed. So we're um, a community interest company of 20 plus associates. We're all creatives, communicators, designers, um, and we're distributed across England and potentially across the whole of the UK. And we all in our own way um, collect objects and art and resources and engage with the public using those those collections. Um, that's what makes us a museum. And we're all about collecting and stirring a response to the climate and ecological emergency. So it's very much a contemporary collecting project. Um, and we so we engage with the wider public but we also run sort of professional training and that's all about enabling museums and libraries and businesses and um, all kinds of organizations to use creativity to engage the public or to engage their communities with the climate and ecological emergency so that's climate museum uk we're quite new um we really only registered and got going um early in 2020 and then the pandemic hit so you know our experimental model suddenly had to go very digital but hopefully we're going to be getting back into the real world a lot of what we do is quite outdoors and we're really into um, a kind of ecological approach to tackling climate change you know ecology in the broadest sense culture declares emergency came along at a very similar time you know um uh, but it, it emerges from actually many years of, um, of practice with the people that co-founded it. So we've all been really engaged in cultural activism um, in relation to climate and ecology for 10, 15, sometimes some of us 20 years. Um, and in early 2019, some of us got together and said, there's this movement to declare emergencies you know councils declaring emergencies could we actually get the cultural sector public and cultural institutions to declare so we were the first declarers initiative um, outside of the kind of government world and we launched in april 2019 and then it sort of sparked a movement of other declarers initiatives like architects declare, music, music declares emergency, tourism declares. So we're forming a sort of ecology of declarers initiatives. And the whole idea is you declare emergency and it doesn't end there. You know, from that point is the moment your life, your organization changes. Um, it's at that point that you take action and form community to hold each other to account. I think it's culture declares emergency that I'm most familiar with your work through um, both in capacity at Union Chapel and the previous cultural organisation I used to work at. Um, how how has that gone? How has it, it feels like that, that really accelerated quite quickly and you got a lot of support and a lot of cultural organisations on board. Yeah, um, it, it accelerated quickly. And then I think, you know, there was a certain... Um, stock of you know individuals that were already um very active and they were very very quick and willing to declare 
and then it sort of slowed down as we were reaching and having to do a bit more persuading and supporting of organizations to declare emergency it's much much harder as an organization and actually we don't want necessarily people to just rush to a quick statement it's really important to kind of you know actually decide what's the purpose of declaring and are we all on board and you know what what is our statement and our plan going to be so in a way that it you know the slow growth in numbers more recently is is actually a a natural thing but we have been really um um active in running a number of advocacy campaigns um uh, which are facing three ways one way is facing into the cultural sector the other way is facing out to the kind of concerned and committed um, um, and activist public and the other way is facing uh, policy makers and funders so you know talking to the arts council for example and saying your strategy um, <laughs> should really be declaring emergency too you know it isn't enough just to mention um, that that climate and ecological collapse is you know is is here in in our world it's it, you actually have to face what that means mm. what that means is covid-19 you know potentially more pandemics you know food shortages growing inequality you know probably an increase in in existing the, the existing kind of racial inequalities that we see are probably just going to increase as people start kind of um, um, focusing in on their own tribes and communities. And it, so, so the role of culture is actually really to try to look at those fractures and those, those um, multiple emergencies and try to um, you know, leverage all the power that we've got to, to help communities be resilient and compassionate and um, and not just to decarbonize, you know, there's so much more to do than just decarbonizing, even though that's so important. Absolutely. And I was going to ask, and that was one of my key questions for you really, is, is for arts organizations who either have declared emergency or are considering uh, con declaring emergency, what is then the next step that you you would expect them to go through? What would you like to see from arts organisation having having made that declaration? You know, I suppose what we might expect is um, is a reflection on the causes of of this of these difficulties. Um, you know, being a, taking time to um, to really think about about why we're here and to maybe use the time that's given to us by this pause to actually try to imagine um, a more regenerative future um, you know how can we how can we um, nurture a more kind of gifting approach you know um, how can we be more resilient locally and what and what can cultural organizations do to help support communities to have their basic needs met you know within the limits of the of the the planetary boundaries mm. this is this is all um work that's that, that's very much resonating with our work at union chapel not only are we considering climate justice as obviously has to be one of our top priorities and how we address that as an organization but also our role with our wider community um and across a range of social justice issues as well and, and you're right, you know, as um, devastating as this last year has been for, for us and many arts organisations, it does also feel like an opportunity to say, OK, and when we get back to business, whatever that might look like, how can we do things differently to, to start addressing um, these issues around climate as well as other social justice issues? Um, reflecting on the film, uh, there were a few things that struck myself um, with regards race to save the world one of the first things i was quite struck by and i wonder if you've come across this through climate museum uk is there's a real there's a there's a lot of ways of being a climate activist um, from breaking into tar sands to protests lobbying to kayak activists which was a new one for me i'd never heard of that um, what what are some of your what are some of the examples of of activism that you are or have seen through the climate museum or and uh, you know culture de declares emergency and what would you say has had the most impact from what you've seen i'm 
quite interested in artwork that um, that really seeks to leverage systemic change. So um, Donella Meadows talked about um, there's you know multiple levels of, of of systems, and then the the level at which you can really change systems is at the level of imagining you know um, really kind of um, a sort of macro level of of understanding um, how mindsets and frames work. So I think that culture has a a really important role to um, to to just completely turn around how we think about what's normal. I just want to mention a couple of other examples of art practice and one is um, the kind of art that deals with legalities and copyright and an example is Aviva Ramani who created um, an artwork called Blued Trees where she painted beautifully <laughs> painted some trees blue and created a musical score and um, those trees and that musical score was her artistic copyright and these trees are in the line of a um, an oil pipeline so it's the idea that art can actually you know um, be valued enough um, and someone's copyright or property can be valued enough to stop um, to be able to stop the the building of a pipeline um, and um, the other kind of artwork that really interests me is is directly regenerative art you know that actually plants trees or that rewilds places in a way that is um, um, done with kind of artistic intention and care from our perspective um, the, the art for social change is something that and systemic change and that's that's the key element isn't it it's, it's, it's a systemic change how do you evidence art enabling or, or uh, galvanizing systemic change is is a very exciting area um, but as you say in terms of framing these stories these issues in a way that people can relate um, is, is you know arts and culture I think is very much you know central to that um, and in, in that respect, do you, it sounds like you feel that arts and culture more generally has a key role to play in, in climate activism specifically. Um, and I wonder, you know, you've, you've touched on some, some elements there. Um, is there an example of an art organisation that you think is actually doing some great way, either in terms of activism or in terms of the, 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 the approach that they're taking to tackling climate justice? Yes, and this is a bit off the top of my head. Um, and I um, have long respected um, Platform, which you can find on platformlondon.org. And they've been um, going for, for many years working on a sort of intersection between art and research and politics um, and doing great work in researching and investigating the power of the fossil fuel industries um, in a way that, um, although based in London, is very international in their outlook and supporting artists from, um, from other, other nations and indigenous artists and for example supporting the um the campaign to um to end the devastating ecocidal impact of um of shell in in nigeria and supporting the agoni people um so supporting that through art practice um as well as political um advocacy so it's a really interesting mix of work one of the other key themes that struck me in the film is uh, around the personal sacrifice that a lot of the individuals in the film, and I know a lot of activists more generally, have or are making for, for the cause, from family sacrifice to um, facing imprisonment in, in some places, in some cases. Um, is that an experience that is either familiar to you personally or um, people that you work with or people in stories that you've come uh, uh, across uh, through the Climate Museum UK? Is that a common yeah. experience? Personally, I've um, sacrificed income <laughs> to, uh, to spend, you know, uh, I suppose half my week or actually four days a week on 
cultural climate and ecological activism and um you know i i gave up working in a full-time manager you know management kind of role um 15 16 years ago because i i really wanted to be able to do work that was more at the edge you know i didn't want to have to tow an institutional line um and increasingly you know my income has gone down and my lifestyle is is you know <laughs> is not what it was um but then on the other hand you know i'm privileged to have that to be able to to do that and then within climate museum uk we uh, we're all very diverse in our in the kinds of activism that we do um for example james aldridge um is vocal and active in support of the lgbtq community and is working on a project called queer river for example which is kind of activism that explores the intersections between um ecological rights and nature connection and um and the experience of, of queer people, you know, in that there is an, a, a cost in that in that there has to be a kind of exposure of one's, you know, self and public life in, into the public into public life as an artist. Mm. Um, in, in Culture Declares Emergency, several of those um, founders and active members have been arrested um, or have done very brave um, acts, for example, Kay Michael, who founded the the project Letters to the Earth, um, took part in a in a brave action last September. So yes, it is everyone everyone tackles it differently. Um, uh, some people support from the back, you know. <laughs> Other people are more more confident to perform and or, or to you know hold their body on the line, as it were. Um, I'm less of a I, I tend to put myself out there less and I'm much more someone that that uses my skills in you know writing and um and camp uh, you know social media and you know catalyzing and connecting but I do I do make I do make objects and <laughs> go out there with you know with with visual art and that that actually brings me to um Aykroyd and Harvey who have been really active in Extinction Rebellion and as co-founders of Culture Declares Emergency amazing artists who are um yeah ecological artists who for example have just um are just installing Boyce's acorns outside Tate Modern and these are trees that they've grown from the acorns that Joseph Boyce planted in Kassel in Germany um, in his piece 7,000 Oaks. Mm. So um, yeah, they're also artists that are ex are dedicated to activism. And it sounds like from what you're saying in your own experiences, there's very different ways um, to, to either actively campaign or, or, or but, but also to address the climate emergency. Um, I think in, in the film and uh, subsequently in conversations, the some people might feel just overwhelmed by uh, I, I, I can't personally put myself on the, the line in that, the way they do in that film. But um, if people wanted to take a more proactive approach to addressing the climate emergency, are there any sort of, I don't know, starter tips um, for, for getting involved at, a, at an initial level in more you know, climate justice work? Gosh, <clears throat> there's so many things to be done. Um, and I think it all, you have to kind of find your, your calling with it in a way. Um, and, and I think that some of the areas that really need attention are tackling the power of the media. So the media is overwhelmingly controlled by um, ecocidal lobbyists, um, you know, people like Rupert Murdoch. Um, and so, you know, there's the, the there's an important role of people to scrutinize and expose media messages. Um, there are important roles in supporting legal campaigns, you know, suing um, governments and um, fossil fuel companies. There's, uh, there's work to be done in prefiguring and imagining more regenerative futures and doing that by, for example, joining food co-ops or, um, you know, community supported agriculture schemes or micro generation of energy and then just normalizing them, you know, just 
rather than it being a strange alternative way of of doing things you know talk about them spread the news and that is all climate activism you know normalizing alternatives um you know it doesn't have to be the kind of heroic acts of um you know gluing yourself to a to a bank door although i'm very grateful but <laughs> people that do that um that's that's brilliant and there's some really um really tangible and and e easier things for people to do but when you when, one of the things you touched on there was um uh, uh tackling the law if you like and one of the things that struck me another thing that struck me in the film was and someone said it i think the quote was corporations have rights but future generations don't Mm -hmm. And, you know, that their, their, their rights are upheld in the laws that we have, not just in the US, but here as well. And there's a, there's a huge role to, to play in, in changing the law. And talking of the law, um, I wondered what your thoughts were on, um, because this is something we're concerned about at Union Chapel on the, the police crime bill and mm -hmm. the impact or potential impact of that on, on activism more generally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really, really worrying. Um, my daughter was at a protest, um, a kill the bill protest, mm -hmm. you know, in central London after lockdown has lifted and only 500 people were there. And and I wouldn't be surprised if that's because they've seen the um, the clashes at the protests in Bristol. And, and uh, you know, many people are fearful and, uh, and it's already giving a sense that protest is, is not allowed, is, you know, well, and of course, the, the heavy handling of the Clapham Common vigil. So, you know, it's all red, although the, you know, the, the, um, the bill hasn't technically passed, I think mm -hmm. that's right no, to say. No, technically it hasn't, no. But, but, you know, it's already got this kind of, you know, damping effect, you know, it's making people fearful. So, um, uh, and, and one factor of it is that it would restrict noise, you know, and, Yes, although it's possible to, to be creative and do kind of silent protests, you know, like in in Turkey, um, the Gezi Park protests, there was like a protest where people were reading books, you know, in the street. That's wonderful. But noise and music and performance are a vital part of protest. So um, it's, you know, there's that and then so many other aspects of, of restriction and repression. I think it's, you know, extremely worrying. Um, and and I think things have changed so much in this country in the last four years. Well, over the last 10, since we've had a conservative government. Um, and then, you know, since since the Brexit government, as it were, it just feels like we're, you know, it's like we're, we are like, um, you know, a frog in, in slowly warming water in more ways than one, you know, politically in this country and then more widely in, in this Glo you know world of global global warming yeah. but we can't accept it yeah, yeah but very deeply concerning times for a range of reasons um mm -hmm. and for yourself uh, and i've asked this of, of other people that i've spoken to given not just the impact of the pandemic and on, on that on our mental health and well-being over the last year but the the, the size of the challenge uh, around the cli climate justice how or what uh, messages might you have for people that, you know, around their mental health and resilience in, in tackling or, or coming to the climate justice fight? I, I actually uh, um, support the idea that we have to express all of our emotions, you know, the full range of emotions. And I'm not that fond of the sort of um, messages that we have to um you know, we mustn't alarm people, we mustn't express, you know, negative stories, because I actually think that we need to, um, in order for us to imagine regenerative possible futures, we have to move through um, the, a, a consideration of, of worse times to come. Mm -hmm. And we have to empathise with people who have lived through catastrophe. We have to actually, you know, see those truths and and move through them to imagine uh you know more compassionate more resilient ways of living so um this principle is what i call being positopian 
So it's a, you know, a vision of the future that is much more... Is this your term, positopian? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's not being positopian. It's not about only having positive futures. It's, um, it's, it's a much wider cone of the future and it's much more kind of like fractal and open but you have to practice being positopian you you have to come back to anticipating futures over and over and over again but do it in a way with other people um where you're where you're not just practicing imagining the future but practicing experimenting with it and living it you know um so that you are actually creating the future you're building the future a wonderful approach to resilience really because you were then prepared for multiple versions of the future yeah um, i'd yeah. love to know more about that uh, yeah in a way so would i you know and that's <laughs> really what we're doing in climate museum we're sort of um we're using our various different activities to to you know we're using objects to um to put an ecological lens on the world and we're using um creative climate conversations to explore how we pre prefigure and and make a more regenerative world brilliant brilliant any final thoughts for anyone that's considering using arts culture um to address the climate crisis um or, or any any more broad thoughts that you might have recommendations for people i think that i would just challenge this notion of using art mm -hmm. i think that um that that the sort of environmental movement wants to kind of you see, sees art or culture as being in service you know mm -hmm. as a kind of as a form of messaging or a um you know sort of backing up science or something but i actually think that culture and art um has many more functions than that so um you know we are all in culture culture is all around us and we can either do it well or we can do it in a way that is degenerative and and, and sparse you know or, or antagonistic so it's actually about all of us living and creating a culture that is you know storied empathetic, imaginative. Um, uh, we, we all just need to, <laughs> you know, do culture better. Yeah. Let's, let's do all do culture better. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a brilliant note to, to finish on. Thank you, Bridget. Great. Thank you for your time and thank you for, for joining us.